Ladies and gentlemen, Brigadier General Becky Halstead! Hey, buddy. I can't even see you, so. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> but you're looking great. Um, I'm really, really glad to be here this morning, Mark. Thanks for the um, short introduction. I didn't know I was short all these years. Um, weren't the testimonies wonderful? I, I mean, personally, I just think it's a great way to start. Um, and then I, it's funny because last night when I got here, I, I flew in from um, Seattle. And so I was laying in bed last night, and you know sometimes you just can't fall asleep. And I got thinking, you know, I, I would love to ask everybody in the room, why are you here today? I mean, why did you come this weekend? And I'd love to know everybody's answer. I, I don't have time to do that, but I think you need to know that answer. And so I had no idea that this is how we were going to start, right? Um, some maybe are here because it's they feel like it's the right thing to do or out of obligation or whatever. But I really hope that you came here wanting to get stirred, you know, wanting to ignite to action something that maybe you have not been doing. And the other thing that struck me is sometimes, especially we as speakers, we're up here and we're speaking to you, the audience, and candidly, you are here. So you kind of already get it. And so the question becomes, why are the others not here? You know, I drive uh, cross country every year. I'm, since I retired in 2008, I, I committed uh, to wanting to see the country. I've been to all 50 states, but you know, I like all the back roads and I like getting coffee for veterans at 25 cents at the local diner, you know, and you know, so, but I like to see the people and everything else. And I always heard um, that we have 60,000 chiropractors in the United States. But when I drive through these towns, like sometimes there's three, four, and five chiropractic offices in a town. And I'm just thinking, do we really have the number 60,000 right? You know, because we got a lot of towns. And then I, then I wonder, well, why are they not here? So one of the things I would add to some of the things that have already been said is, you know, it's important that you yourself really have this drive and determination and, and reconnect um, with your passion and your purpose as to why you're here. But go back home and share that with the other chiropractors in your town. Share it with your patients, because I love it when I talk to, I've gone to a couple of college graduations, and when the kids walk across the stage, you know, I'll ask them, you know, why, why did you decide to become a chiropractor? Well, it was because I went to a chiropractor when I was a child, and I, I watched that chiropractor, and I was like, I want to be them when I grow up. You know, that's what it's all about. When you've been mentored, you want to grow up to be like that person. And so what I would really encourage you as you're going through the weekend is to think about your kind of strategic plan of how are you going to take this back to wherever it is that you live and you work. And, you know, you don't, there's room for more than one chiropractor in a town. So if that chiropractor hasn't showed up lately to the state association or to a, par a Parker conference or whatever, knock on their door and invite them. Because it is, I am not a chiropractor, as you know. I mean, I was a soldier for 27 years. And, but I am a patient. And I love your talented hands, minds, and hearts. I can candidly tell you that, I mean, since I retired, I've really only routinely gone to a chiropractor. But before I retired, I was always at Walter Reed. I was on 15 different prescription medications for fibromyalgia. You know, and I was, I mean, I retired because I was ill. And my story is, if I'd known more about chiropractic while I was in the military, I'd probably still be in the military with some of my classmates. You know, but, I, but I'm not, so I'm not doing this, but, uh, and speaking on leadership. But I just, I, my sensing is, you know, these stories need to go viral. Chiropractic needs to go viral. Our nation needs health care, not sick care, right? They need you. And so, you know... That's not what I'm here to necessarily talk about today, but I do hope that what you, when you get fired up this weekend, and there's no doubt you're going to, because you already heard some stories that are very touching. I mean, I'm in the back going, well, I can't really get emotional. I'm going on in like five minutes. Plus, I have a cold, so I already sound emotional. But, 
Um, but I want you to take that and go, you know, if you have something that's beautiful, it only remains beautiful if you share it. You know, that's the difference between being successful and being significant. Share it. So I kind of got introduced to chiropractic through Dr. Carolyn Melizia, um, a great, great, great gal, uh, practiced in New York, um, and we still do quite a bit of work together. And Carol Ann is the one who uh, took me under her wing when she heard me speak at West Point one year. And her sister and I were classmates at West Point, so that's how I got to meet her. She just happened to sit next to my mother during a seminar like this, and they got chatting and you know how mothers talk, and chiropractors are not exactly introverts. So my mother, she tells her the whole story about you know how I'm back from a rock on my R and R leave for two weeks, and and Carol Ann was saying, wow, you know I really enjoyed hearing her speak at dinner, and. My mom says, well, I don't know if you can tell or not, but she's really quite ill with fibromyalgia. So being the, what I'll call, stereotypical normal chiropractor, as soon as she heard those words, she was on a healing mission. And so she found me in the hallway and grabbed me and poked her finger in my chest and said, you don't have to live in chronic pain. And I'm like, who are you? You know, <laughs> and that was my star you just touched right there, you know. So anyhow, we became great friends. and. That's really when I started to learn more and more about chiropractic. I mean, I had gone to a chiropractor a couple times because my dad did when I was home in New York, but never, never really took it seriously. I, I knew I always felt better, but I didn't understand it. Um, so when I retired, I started to do more and more with the chiropractic community and the Foundation for Chiropractic Progress and, and visiting the schools and the different state associations. And all, I, I just want to just commend you for what you do. I want to encourage you to keep doing it. People like me are so much healthier because of it. I will continue to tell your story, but there's nothing more powerful than you telling your own story, okay? Because you are out there every day helping people who really need you. And so when Mark asked me to speak um, this time, not so much on my chiropractic story, but from a perspective of leadership and how in your practice, maybe I can help reignite that passion and purpose in you. So in the process of of all these trips to different colleges, I have to tell you, I really fell in love with the Parker principles. You know, I mean, they're really good. And so I actually wrote a book on leadership, and so when he asked me to come speak, um, I said, well, you know what I'd like to do is I would like to take the Parker principles, and I'm gonna put them on slides, and I'm gonna show the parallel between the leadership principles that I used in the military for 27 years how, how there's, there's such an alignment with the Parker principles, but I want you to rehear the Parker principles, but you're gonna hear my stories, okay? And then I want you to be thinking about, man, when's the last time I dusted off those Parker principles? How can I, what are my stories and how can I apply them? How, does that sound fair? So I, I, some of you may have heard some of them before, but I hope you'll enjoy them. So that, you know, the very first one, to eliminate fear, worry, and anxiety, I must live in the present, and let go and let God. So I put up this collage of my journey because every single one of you are in a journey right now. You are until the day that you die. It's a journey, there are ups and downs. I, I saw this really cute thing on Facebook and it was, um, uh, it, it was a, a nice little chart, X and Y axes, X and Y axes, whatever that is, I've been a long time since I've been in college, and then a, a straight line. And it says, oh, that's what life looks like. You start out down here, you end up here, it's a nice straight line. And, and everybody, when you're up here, you kind of look back and it seems more straight than it was, you know. And then at next slide it says, but here's what it really looks like, and the line is all over the place, right? And that's so much more accurate. Because every single one of us have had some really, you know, pits, some valleys, you know. And then we've had some high points in our life. And I've taken those two slides and done an entire keynote just on that. And I share experiences like, you know, being healthy, being ill, right? Three major surgeries when I was a very young captain in the military, them telling me, there's no way, you're gonna be out of the army, you're not gonna have a career. And I was like, excuse me, but I think I know myself better than you do. And you know, these are not major surgeries. You know, I'm not, I am not terminal here, I'm just losing a few organs that I can live without. And I will go out and I will get in shape and I will prove to the military that I need to stay. And, you know, and that was in 1984 and I stayed until 2008, so it worked, okay? Um, but you know, and then I was married and then I was divorced, so you know, you get the idea, right? We all have these above the lines, below the lines, above the lines, below the lines. 
and you know, practice is doing well, maybe practice is not doing so well, whatever. And just what you have to do is figure out when you're below the line, you gotta keep looking up and looking out. Looking up and looking forward. But so many of us, once we are below the line and we start kind of going, oh, woe is me, we can't get out of that foxhole of, of you know, kind of pity or whatever, or man, everything's against me. I know when I used to go and talk to my soldiers and they'd been wounded or their buddy had been killed and they just can't get out of that, ah, oh, that foxhole of what I'll call pity. And I'll say to them, you have to get out of that. You know, I don't know why your buddy was killed and you were not, but here's what I do know. If you stay down here and you don't continue to live your life and look up, let go and let God look up and look forward, then the enemy just got a second kill and you're it. Why would we let, why would we want the enemy to do that? So the collage, the purpose of that is just look at your own life, your own collage. And who are the people in your life that help bring you sometimes out of that? Because if you ever wondered, if somebody helped me, the question becomes, then who have I helped? Have you ever gotten a thank you note and go, wow, that made me really feel good? Oh, well, good, that's supposed to. When's the last time you wrote one? I mean, if something makes you feel good, wouldn't it be only make sense that you ought to replicate that and do it for somebody else? Two most powerful words in the English language are thank you. Putting your arm around somebody and encouraging them. Now, in leadership, I always say, you know, that, that leaders have to be able to do two things. Slap somebody on the back and kick them in the butt, and they're only 8 to 10 inches apart. Okay? But as a leader, you got to be able to do both. All right, so much like parenting, isn't it? You know, you give credit where credit's due, but man, when they need a little bit of an adjustment, not the adjustment you're used to, but give them a kick, right? But you got to be able to do both. Give credit where credit is due. And I've had chiropractors who've come to me and talked about their practice and where they're having a problem, maybe with someone on their team, and they don't know what to do. And I said, well, the first thing you do know is that you know you need to do something, or you wouldn't be asking me what to do, right? But when you have a challenge, when you have a conflict on your team, those are the hardest things to deal with. Because, you know, you like the people on your team. And when I was in Iraq, I wore my dog tags, and I wore on my dog tags a shield of faith, Joshua 1.9. And it talked about, you know, be strong and courageous. Do not be discouraged. Do not be terrified. The Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Now, you would think in combat when you're being shot at and all everything's going on, you'd be scared. You'd be terrified. But I have to tell you, I didn't experience that. What I fought was being discouraged. Now, the verse says, don't be discouraged. But I really fought being discouraged because sometimes my soldiers made really stupid mistakes, stupid decisions. And it just broke my heart. I had to relieve people on the battlefield. No worse place to have to relieve a commander or relieve somebody than on the battlefield. So that means their career is over. But you, as a leader, you have to be able to do those tough things as well. But in your journey, in your journey, you cannot control everything. You control the response, but you don't control everything that's happening to you. But you do have to stop. You have to just breathe and you have to let go and look up for guidance and look forward and i love this one if it is to be it's up to me so all the leadership training that i do for folks is all on the on the premise of these two things leadership is a choice and the first person i must lead is myself because you know if you're not i saw in the in the video as we started right the big word that came out of there standards well, if you're not the standard, there is no way that you can expect the people in your office to be the standard. You just can't. I mean, you can try, but if you're the leader and you're not living by example and you're not the standard, you can talk all day long, but there, there just can't be an expectation that everybody else is going to be the standard. So as a, in the Army, what I would say is that as a general, I would never ask my soldiers to do that which I'm not willing to do myself. So, you know, you saw me with my weapon out on the range and, and, and practicing and qualifying just like the youngest private on my team. Now, I have to admit there were a couple times I was a little nervous because I'm a pretty good shot and I've been shooting a weapon for a long time. And before we went into Iraq, you know, it's all live fire and um, everybody's got a loaded weapon and the targets are down there, but you walk this way and then you get the command to turn and shoot at the target. And I can remember a private being behind me, and I, sometimes I'd turn like this, and they're still pointing at me, you know. 
So you also have to have faith in your team. You have to, uh, you know, a lot of trust, a lot of faith. And, um, you know, but, but remember that sometimes those in front of you, behind you, and the side of you, they don't have the same amount of experience. They don't have the same amount of knowledge. They, and you need to coach them and mentor them and encourage them because you are from a, maybe a different position. You have more experience. But at the end of the day, leading yourself first is so important. It starts there. So, you know, I would look in the mirror every day, every single day. Still do it. But it was a little more dramatic as, a, as an officer, as a soldier, because I had my uniform on. And I would grab my dog tags, and I would, I would hold my dog tags in my hands, and I would recite the warrior ethos. I'll always play submission first. I'll never accept defeat. I'll never quit. I'll never leave a fallen comrade. You know, and then i drape them over my head, and I would recite... Joshua 1, 9, like I said. And I would just look myself in the mirror and say, Becky, you need to be the best person that you can be today. Notice I didn't say the best general. General is just a rank. Doctor of chiropractic is a title. What you do is you heal. What you are about is what's on the inside. It isn't that title on your card. It is about your heart and your mind. Being a general was just a rank that I achieved. What I was was a soldier, a competent, knowledgeable, caring, committed soldier. And I just wanted to make sure that every day I committed first to myself to be the best person that I could be. Because if it is to be, it is up to me. And then by my being the best that I can be, I expected others to do the same. And when you look yourself straight in the mirror and you connect with yourself eye to eye, you have to do that in order for me then to connect with you. Because if I can't look myself eye to eye, I cannot look you eye to eye. And I think most of you get that because I have to tell you that in my exposure to chiropractors, well, the difference I saw between the medical doctors that I saw in the military and chiropractors is that you listen. You, you, know, you would ask me, my chiropractors would ask me a question and they actually listen to the answer. In the military, you know, a doctor asks me a question and they're already writing notes and looking at a screen and doing something else while I'm over there talking. They don't have a clue what I said. Because why? Because they're all knowing for little parts. You know, not the whole body like you. But that doesn't relieve you of your responsibility to listen. I think most of you are good listeners and most of you do look at your, your patients and, and, and allow them to be part of the solution. But if you don't, you need to. Because that's what leaders do. Leadership is about the lead. Chiropractic is about the patient. Teaching is about the student. Preaching is about the congregation. You gotta remember it that way. That's the way you're gonna help people. So we see things as we are, not necessarily as they are. Now I own a little camp up in upstate New York on a lake and I was going down to the lake and I saw this beautiful dragonfly. Would you agree that's a pretty nice dragonfly? Ran up to the house and got my camera, came back down, took a picture of it. Now, that should not make any sense to you at all, right? Because dragonflies fly around. But that's what I did. And I got a great shot with my telephoto lens and just captured that. And so usually when I put that up, I'll ask the audience, how many of you are soaring high and looking good like that dragonfly and feeling good about life? And uh, lots of people raise their hand. I said, that's great. Now, here's the deal. That dragonfly, that's the way you see it, but it's not soaring high. Look at the top right-hand corner. Do you see the little white lines? That dragonfly is stuck in a cobweb. It's not going anywhere. Matter of fact, it's about to die. Sometimes we see ourselves as soaring high and feeling good and looking good, but some of the people around us know we're about to die. You know, you may think your practice is doing really well, but trust me. Okay? You know, maybe like in the military, you get a promotion and you're feeling really good about it and other people are going, going to be the last one. <laughs> Not sure how you made it in there this time, that's the last one. How many of us are missing the cobwebs in our life, but everybody else can see them? How many of you see the cobwebs in other people's life and have the intestinal fortitude and the willingness to talk to them about their cobwebs? Most of us are pretty good about talking to somebody else about their cobwebs. We're not as really as good as listening to them talking to us about our cobwebs, right? But you should be doing both. Some of the best guidance 
coaching, encouragement, and mentorship that I have received in my life is because somebody had the intestinal fortitude to come up to me and talk to me about my cobwebs. I can remember a boss once saying to me, Becky, you're doing a great job. He rated me as his number one commander in Hawaii. Oh, you're feel, I'm feeling pretty good. I'm soaring high. And then he says, but, hey, but you're a little too defensive. Too defensive, sir? What do you mean I'm too defensive? <laughs> Talk to me. He says, Halstead, go figure it out. Just walk back to your office and figure it out. His name is General Hill. We, we now do a gig together about mentorship. He was my mentor on the mentee and building a legacy. So I walk back to my office and I go, how did he get that so wrong? I am not defensive. I'm passionate. I'm, I'm, I'm full of energy. I love what I do. I love my people. I love our mission. How could I come across as being defensive? And here's the first point. Whether I'm defensive or not doesn't really matter. If he thinks I am, that's what matters. Have you ever put yourself in the, in the seat of your patient? How do they perceive you? How are they seeing you or your team that you lead or your family members or your community? Are you the chiropractor in your community that shines because you bring people together because success is a team sport? Or are you the chiropractor in your community that is, I stand alone because what I do is completely right and the rest of you are wrong, you know? Which are you? How, how, do, you, how do you work within your own community? So I had to think about it, and what I realized was there were a few things that were happening. When he would ask me a question, I would get very excited about my answer, and I'd think about it, and then I'd start answering him, and, 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 the, and the more excited I got, the faster I, I spoke and the louder I got. Most men do not like to hear women talk really fast and get really loud. They go, la, 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 la. I don't know what I asked her, but remind me never to ask her that again, right? <laughs> I'm stereotyping just a little bit, but you know, he's like, oh, oh, I see a hot flash coming on. <laughs> but he gave me great guidance. Because see, as a leader, when your spouse stops listening, when your team stops listening, when your patient stops listening, you just lost your vote. You can talk faster, you can talk louder, but you just lost your vote. You don't want to lose your vote. You want to be influential. You want to stir them to do things differently. So are you soaring high or are you in a cobweb? And if you're in a cobweb, are you looking at those, you know, looking at it and trying to figure out what it is so you can be released? By the way, I saved it. I released it from the cobweb. Last time I saw it, it flew away. Don't know after that. Okay, another great Parker principle. I will anticipate the good even during the bad. Now, I actually have this again later in the presentation from a different perspective. In this perspective, this I want to talk about the challenge of when you know you've got to do something really hard. I'll say that makes it bad because, you know, you're dreading it, but you know you kind of have to do it. The best way to get through it is to anticipate the good that will come out of it. So in this, in this particular picture, I'm going to Air Assault School at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. And, that, and I was in my mid-30s, and that's where we learned to um, do everything possible with a helicopter in the Army. We learned how, much, how many people and supplies you can put in the helicopter. We move helicopters all over the battlefield in order to move people and supplies to the fight. And so I went to Fort Campbell, Kentucky, and as a leader, as a leader in that division, I wanted to make sure that I was wearing those wings on my uniform because that would demonstrate, just by seeing that on my uniform, that would demonstrate to other people that I had the competence, that I'd been to the school that I graduated, right? I mean, that's, you know, do you hang certificates on your wall, right? I mean, people come in, you'd like them to know, I graduated from Parker, you know, I went to school, I have a degree. Maybe you don't, maybe you do, but in the military, we wear badges to show that we've been through that training. So if you're gonna be in that type of unit, you want to have been through that training and graduated. So there's a, there's a respect with the people that you're leading. So when I, when I found out I was going, a bunch of my friends said, are you crazy? I said, yes, why do you ask? They said, you're old. See, only in the Army can you be old in your mid-30s. Some of you didn't even start chiropractic until you were 30. 
only in the army. But so they said, you're too old. And oh, by the way, you're short. And I'm like, I can take the old comment, but that short comment, Mark, that's not nice. I said, too short. All right. You know, when I entered the army in 1977, though I was six foot tall, okay, the army just beat me up. So I said, well, I bet there's some short people out there wearing that badge, and I'm going to find them. So I went and found them, and went, if they can do it, I can do it. I think you heard that already once, right, today? If somebody else before you can do it, I can do it. Think about the chiropractors, like, like Mark, three generations. You know, when you think about people who are in prison doing something they're so passionate about, how is it that it's so hard for us to muster the same passion when we're not even in fear of being arrested? And I kind of kind of understand that just from being a woman in a man's army a little bit, you know. It wasn't exactly fun. Um, so I was uh, one of two women in this particular course. And, um, and I, I was short, so off we went. So the two-week course is 10 days, actually, 10 days. And on the very last day, we do 12-mile foot march. Anybody been to Kentucky in August? <laughs> Sucks. <laughs> I say that in the night, most Christian way I can. And... Um, you know, my mother hates that word. Oh, I hate that word. I said, but mom, that's the only way to describe it. It's 100% humidity. It's Kentucky. It's horrible, you know. You can cut out a piece of air and carry it with you. So, you know, so we're in full rucksack, helmet, weapon, canteens. You know, I'm about 40 pounds in my rucksack and my helmet. 101 degrees on the bank marquee as I went in at 4.30 that morning to do the 12 miles. You have to do the 12 miles in three hours. So for all you that are fast at math, that's 15-minute miles. You, can, you have to do it unassisted. Nobody can help you. People can yell and scream at you, which they do a lot of that. But uh, you, you, nobody can help you. And um, it's over hill and dale, you know. And so off we go. At the six-mile point, I stop, drink all my water, and I reward myself. I move my M16 rifle from my right hand to my left hand. You know, because this one is going like this after six miles. But I reward myself. So here's a question I have for you. How many of you, and I know yours, there's a lot of you that are very, very driven. You've been in this business for a long time, and maybe the reason why you've lost a little bit of the passion, why you, you're not sure about the purpose anymore, is because you've run yourself into the ground. You haven't done a cabin experience. You haven't stopped to reflect. You haven't taking time, you know, and this weekend's a good place to do it. This is why Parker conferences, I think, are very good. You're at least stopping for a weekend. But how are you stopping and reflecting and regrouping and kind of re, you know, kind of re-engineering where you need to go? How many of you take your whole office someplace away from the office and do that for the whole team? I used to do that in the Army for my team. We call it an off-site. Take the whole team to someplace, totally not military, blue jeans, life is good t-shirts, you know, and we talk about what, what we have on the training calendar, what's coming up, but at the same time, you know, we did some, you know, we played some games, we did some competitive things, we had the families there in the evenings, and we just let our hair down. A good friend of mine speaks, Allison Levine, about, she, she climbed, she's climbed the highest summit in every uh, continent, and she's my size, okay? It's a crazy, incredible lady. And, um, but she ties it all to leadership. And she says, you know, that the majority of the people who die climbing mountains do not die on the way up. They die on the way down. Because, see, most of us are so focused on that, that goal up here. You know, certain number of patients and certain amount of money, whatever, whatever. And they're so focused on the top that when they get there, they can, they're, they're so worn out they can't even enjoy it. That flame starts to flicker. We don't want that to happen to you. We don't want that to happen to you. So I'm on this... Foot march at six mile mark, I kind of reward myself and off I go. At the nine mile mark, you see the big dude in the picture there? By the way, this is a Polaroid picture. I'm dating myself a little bit. That's a Polaroid picture that I scanned in and enlarged, so that's why it looks a little not so clear. Uh, but at any rate, so I was so excited the day I found it. I can see you're, ex it's just as excited for me. But uh, <laughs> anyhow, so uh, I get to the nine mile mark and this dude here in the middle, he's a sergeant, ranger. 25 years old, you know, stud. He goes zipping by me. And then he stops and he walks. Well, I'm doing a steady pace. Because at five foot one and a half, you're not walking. You're just doing like a jog the whole way. Because if you walk, you're not going to make it. I mean, you're just not going to make it. Your, your legs will die. So I'm doing my little steady thing. So I pass him, he passes me. We do this three times. The third time he says, ma'am, you're killing me. I said, who are you and why do I care? 
Like, this is an individual event. He says, I'm a ranger. And if you beat me to the finish line, my ranger buddies will never let me live it down. I'm like, ah, oh, <laughs> we're going to have some fun. Okay, so here's a couple things. As a leader, you always need to remain real, real and humble. Reality is, the chances of little Becky Halstead in her 30s beating stud ranger, 25 years old, who's, you know, arms are bigger than my legs, he can crush me, the chances of me beating him are not very good. Rea that's reality. Now, he might pass out, he might take a wrong turn, and I might beat him, but, you know, chances are I'm not going to. Okay? So are you being real about your practice? Are you being real about yourself? Are you being real about your team? Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't keep striving, maybe to be the number one chiropractor in town, but I'm going to tell you what you really need to do is be striving for the greater good. Strive to be the best that you can be, the best that you can be, the best that your practice can be, even when things get rough. So I was feeling pretty rough. I, I am just thinking I just want to cross the finish line in my three hours. But I don't mind kind of making him earn it either. So off we go. So we do this the whole way. He ends up first, I end up second. And so I look at it like this. Being second to a ranger, that is darn good. Okay, that is darn good, especially as a woman. Five foot one woman, old lady, they called me. But here's a couple other things that I know about that day. He was pushing me. I ran the fastest 12-mile foot march that I ever ran in my 27 years in the Army. Less than two and a half hours. That's smoking it, people. I can't even do that on the treadmill now. Yeah, hoo <laughs> I was stud up, man. I was smoking it. So, uh, so that was good. So see, when you push people and they push you, the best comes out. Now, I don't even know his name. I don't know. I doubt it was the fastest he ever ran it. But we all know this. He had to earn beating me. He had to work for that. And I do know this. He ran it faster than he had intended on running it when he woke up at 4 o'clock that morning. Okay? So ask yourself, how are you helping each other? You know, just like Mark had you just go through the drill, talk to each other, reinforce with each other. You will. You know? And if I could go through that with this guy, I'd say, you will probably beat me, but I will make you earn it. Okay? But how are you going to bring out the best in each other? Because if you can do that, you will bring out the good in even bad situations. You know, I just believe that leaders need to be good bad news takers. There's no way to get out of this. You cannot be in this world and not have to deal with bad news. But you can be a good bad news taker. There's no way you can be in this world and not deal with chaos. But you can be the calm in the chaos. Some of us, instead of being the calm in the chaos, we, are, we become part of the chaos. I was married, I'm divorced. Not really proud of that fact, but I learned a lot. Like, when I would come home after a bad day of work and maybe really upset with my boss and share that with my ex-husband, I learned very quickly not to do that anymore because now I had two people I had to deal with. Because <coughs> he'd be so mad, I'm going to go in there and give him a piece of my mind, he can't be talking to my wife like that, and I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. But he was serious. You know, he's like picking up the phone, telling my, but you don't do that. No. Yeah. So now I got two angry people. So, you know, you got to ask yourself, when things are chaotic, are you part of the chaos or are you the calm in the chaos? Because there's nothing worse than when you become part of the chaos. I can remember the door, knock at the door at my little hooch in a rock. Middle of the night. Not good in the middle of the night. Every phone call in the middle of the night was tragedy. Knock on the door, open the door, half a dozen of my staff there. White as ghosts. I didn't have to ask. I already knew it was bad news. Helicopter down. Everybody on the helicopter killed. And at that moment, you know what happens as a leader? You want to know where, why, what happened. Do we know? You know, you just a thousand questions go through your mind. But you've got to use that three-second rule of just pausing. Don't say the first thing that comes to your mind because most of the time you're going to regret it. If you can practice a three-second rule, which is not saying anything for three seconds, you'll be a lot happier with what you say, okay? Just take it in. Just bring them in. Sit them down. Help them get through it. Ask the right questions, not all the questions. Because if you don't, you become part of the chaos, and they don't need that. 
Okay, seeing is not believing. Believing is seeing. I love this one. This is um, First Sergeant Acosta. Um, I have so much more uh, respect for people who can really believe in something even though they haven't experienced it themselves. They can really, you know, they, they step out on faith because they, they're informed enough to know that this works and that it's right. And, you know, I love people with really strong convictions as long as they do it in a very respectful way in order to get more people feeling the same conviction instead of turning people off. And uh, I remember we were attacked on our base in Balada Rock, and I was uh, running on a treadmill, and I, I heard all the mortars going and the sirens going, and so I ran over to my headquarters to find out you know, where the attack was and everything that was going on, and, and we had several people wounded and, and injured through the mortars, and so I, then I went over to the hospital because I happened to be there at the, at, 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 on the base at the time. Um, with 20,000 soldiers operating out of 55 bases, I was all over Iraq, so I wasn't always you know, right where some of these things happened, but when I could be there, I was there, and in this case, I was at Bilal, and I was able to go to the hospital and see the wounded. And this uh, gentleman, First Sergeant Acosta, uh, he was outside running, and uh, when the mortars hit, uh, shrapnel went through one eye and out the other eye. I mean, essentially, it ricocheted through the other eye. So when I went in, which was not unusual, when I would go see soldiers, the doctors would often tell me things they had not even told the soldiers yet, you know, just to, just to prepare me for what I was going to see and how I was going to handle the conversation and everything. And, and the doctors had told me that, you know, he, he lost his sight, he'll be blind, um, and just nothing they can do. But the fact was that he had n absolutely no brain damage. And so the doctors are just like, that is like nothing short of a miracle. Uh, you know, but he, he is blind. So, you know, you know, this is not something that you get trained on, you know, I mean, this is, there's no school for how do you hold someone's hand and talk them through this? How do you, you know, how do you do that? You just do it. So, um, so I went in and I, I had a purple heart for him and you can see the purple heart on the, on the blanket and I held his hand and I talked to him and he could, he could feel how sweaty my hand was, even though he had he, he, under a lot of morphine uh, to, for the pain. And he said, ma'am, do not feel sorry for me. Before I could even really say anything to him, ma'am, do not feel sorry for me. He says, I know I'm blind, but I do know this. I will get to feel the hug of my wife again. I will get to walk my daughter down the aisle. And when the bus comes home with the rest of the unit, I will know them by their voices. That is believing without seeing. In that moment, it struck me that he had 20-20 vision where most of us with 20-20 vision don't. Where we just take our health for granted. To me, that was just so powerful. I've talked about his story so many places, but that is believing. That's truly seeing without having eyes. How many of you are seeing your, your profession, seeing your life through the lens of faith and and uh, desire to be the best and to make a difference for other people, not just for yourself. Okay, oops, I got one down there, did I got one up there? There we go. I cannot communicate successfully and efficiently what I do not own. You know, you can always tell someone who is uh, talking the talk, but not walking the talk, right? And I, I have told several people, you know, they ask me which chiropractor should they go to and everything else. I said, well, I, I don't know. I don't know all the chiropractors. Let me tell you what I see and what's important to me and why I go to the chiropractors that I go to, you know. And I go to chiropractors who walk the talk. If they're going to tell me that I need to change my nutritional intake, then I'm expecting that they understand that and they're doing the same right, that I'm not then going to see them some other time, and they're just like, well, wait a second, you told me, you know, right, I want to see them leading by example, leading by example, I want to see them owning it, same way with leading in the military, I wanted my soldiers to see, not a general, I wanted my soldiers to see a seasoned soldier that owned it, 
that did it herself. And I'll tell you, being five foot one and a half was a bit of a challenge. You know, the greatest shock factor is walking in the room and people going, you're the general? You know, when I got my wisdom teeth out at Walter Reed, you know, the dentist is in there digging deep for, the, for my, my teeth, and he goes, so I understand you're going to Italy. I swear I'm going to Italy. What's your daddy going to do over there? I'm like, my daddy isn't going. I'm the officer, you know, I'm the, <laughs> I'm the lieutenant. You know, it was always like, you know, what does your dad do? What does your husband do? Because I certainly couldn't be the officer, right? You know, I, I love it when I go to speak places and they, they hear the gen a general's coming to speak. And then they, I walk out and I'm the person they ask, like, where's the coffee? You know, <laughs> that's, that's really happened. I've, I've, I've had a lot of fun with some audiences going, hey, dude, did you find your coffee? You know, but I go back because I don't care. It doesn't bother me. Because, see, it's not about what's on the outside. It's about what's on the inside, you know? You don't need to be six foot six on the outside if you're six foot six on the inside with your character and your confidence. Because that's gonna shine. That's gonna shine. And when you own it, you really will be able to communicate that successfully. And not just efficiently, but effectively. See, because if you if you have the passion for chiropractic and you are communicating that to your patients and to your family and to your community, you will stir in some people to wanna really take a second look at that profession, maybe even do that profession themselves. But you can't do it unless you own it. Just can't do it unless you own it. Oh, by the way, in that picture, I apologize. So I was sitting with an Iraqi colonel, and um, so we don't need to go back. You remember the last picture, right? I apologize, I hit the button too fast. I was sitting there with an Iraqi, well, can you go back? Maybe I can go back. I don't really go in reverse, reverse very often. I do now with my GPS that has a mirror on it. The other day I got my Lexus that doesn't have that little screen, and I actually hit a car in my own driveway. <laughs> See how you get used to things? Don't tell on me, though, because I didn't do any damage to that car. I, I put the mirror back the way it was, and it's, it's all good. OK. <laughs> uh, full transparency and honesty. OK. Uh, in that picture, I just want to share with you there that, um, by the way, do you think I look a little different now than I do in that picture? Maybe you can't quite tell, but when I came back from Iraq, people said, oh my gosh, like, you know, you look horrible. You know, you got the thousand mile stare. I'm, well, you would look horrible too if you've been in Iraq for a year. But on top of that, with the fibromyalgia and everything else, and I do, a, a, in some of my presentations, I'll show that is the before chiropractic and this is the after. You know, today I'm a little under the weather with a cold, so maybe I don't look as good. But in my mind, I've come a long way, baby, and I thank you for that. But, yeah, who up? So, uh, thanks. But you have to be able to sit down with your team and listen. Remember, I talked about listening before, and I was sitting there with my Iraqi team, and, you know, and I, I didn't know that much about the Iraqi army until I was over there, but I needed to listen. I needed to stop and go, okay, what are the challenges? How can I help? You know, and then I had to really be very careful and choose my words wisely when I was coaching them. And so all I would just say to you is that, you know, don't be in a rush when you are coaching people. That's not the time to be in a rush. Think about what you're going to say. And if somebody's going to come to your office to get your guidance or whatever, prepare ahead of time and think about what it is you might want to convey in that conversation. I never met anybody in my office that I didn't already have some notes on my desk. If I knew who was coming, I had a pretty good idea why they're coming to visit me. And I just had a little outline because in the, in the process and the emotion of the conversation, sometimes you forget. And I just had a little checklist there. And I did it for good conversations and I did it for bad conversations. You know, if I had somebody you know, in front of my desk that I needed to relieve, uh, in my book I write about a chaplain that I had to relieve in Iraq who uh, I had to do an Article 15. And so, you know, I mean, it, to relieve a chaplain is pretty bad, okay? I mean, it doesn't get much worse than that. And I was really kind of nervous about it and I had this outline and I had everything tabbed and whatever and, and uh, the story is a great story but I don't have time to tell you this morning, but you know, you can read about it or whatever, ask me later. But you know, that, those outlines help you steer the conversation, help you to stay on target and on focus with what it is you want to, uh, to do, okay? All right, so now I'll advance. There we go, loving service is my first technique. Boy, you know, you all really, you get this. Maybe you lose it along the way a little bit and you have to get, you know, refocused, I don't know, but I, I think the majority of you 
the majority of you come into this profession because of what you can do for other people, not for what the profession can do for you. Now, maybe as your practice grows and becomes more successful, just like in any profession, it's easy then to start for it to start to be about yourself. And try not let, to let it be that. Always go back to leadership is about the lead. Being a, a, a doctor or chiropractic is about the patient and your team. I mean, if you start to think too highly of yourself, man, get the pin out, punch the balloon, and get over it, you know? It's about those you lead. It's about those you heal. That's loving service. I love this picture because these are all soldiers from Samoa. And they, they're just, a, well, there's only about a dozen in there, maybe eight or ten. But 67 Samoan soldiers became U.S. citizens in Iraq in Saddam Hussein's theater. And I got to swear them in as U.S. citizens. And I thought, wouldn't he just roll over in his little hole? You know, <laughs> right? I mean, yeah, it's just like, but, but what I really loved about it was we talk about loving service. I don't think it gets any more loving than to serve a nation that you're not even a citizen of yet and be willing to die for it. And I went to several funerals over there for Samoan soldiers. They're willing, they believe so much in what we were about and what we were doing that they joined the U.S. military and served without even being U.S. citizens yet. So we had the 67 and they became U.S. citizens right there in Balad, Iraq, in Saddam Hussein's uh, theater. And I got to be the one with the folks from D.C. to, to do that ceremony. And I, it, just, it was like a high that I've never experienced before a love that you kind of never experience. You just go, I cannot hug these kids enough. And I want you to have the same feeling when you are hugging your patients. I cannot hug them enough. I cannot love them enough because what you do is about loving service. So this is my other, I will anticipate the good even during the bad. Look, many times in life we do all the right things and get the wrong result, or a result that we did not want. It happens. I bet you could sit here, and every single one of you around the room could tell you about a wrong result, but in your heart of hearts, you did everything you thought was right. We had some Marines at a checkpoint. They followed the rules of engagement. They did everything they were supposed to do with an oncoming vehicle to their checkpoint. They fired around into the air. The vehicle did not slow down. They fired around into the front tire. The vehicle did not slow down. They fired around into the grill of the vehicle. The vehicle did not slow down. So the last thing you do is you shoot to kill. They fired into the windshield and killed the driver. And when the process of doing that, of course, now the vehicle goes, float, ro uh, rolls over. Everyone in the vehicle was killed but little Omar. It was a, a lady driving the vehicle with her sister, a couple of her kids. He is the only survivor. That is his father to my, uh, to my left. So, <coughs> you know, what do you do? You know, you, you're, you're, your country just killed this man's family, except for his one little boy. And all I knew that I could do would be at least go and sit with him and sit with his child. We brought his child to the hospital where it was in, on my base, Balad. And for six months, <coughs> excuse me, he went through treatment there. And every Sunday, excuse me, I apologize. Every Sunday, I went and sat with them. We taught little Omar, Omar how, to, how to salute um, with his left hand because his right hand was too wounded. And, you know, you just embrace the father. The father was so grateful that we saved his son, but I just would always think, oh, my gosh. You know, how does he not let, like, a hatred or an anger for us rule over the love for us for taking care of his son? So, anyhow you got to anticipate the good even during the bad, and that was a very bad situation. But what I was always trying to do is to anticipate that by going over there every Sunday that maybe something good could come out of that. And, and a lot of good did come out of that because we saved his child, and we formed a good relationship with him, and he saw that we really are loving people and we do care. But what a hard way to do it. And then develop a compassion to serve that is greater than the compulsion to survive. So again, you can imagine going to Iraq, the number one thing on your mind is, I gotta live through this. You know, I don't wanna get killed. 
I don't want my soldiers to get killed. But you soon, very soon, that all goes by the wayside. You're focused not on, not on how to stay alive. You're focused on how to get the mission done. You're focused on your team. As a matter of fact, going to Iraq with chronic fibromyalgia, people say, how did you survive? I said, because I wasn't thinking about me. I mean, I knew I had it. I knew I was miserable. I felt miserable. But I spent so much time thinking about the team and the mission and others that I could pretty much keep my mind off myself. And for a year, you can kind of get away with that. But then, you know, then you kind of collapse when you get back. But, but you have to have a compassion to serve others that's greater than your own desire just to survive, for your own practice just to survive. What good does it do if you're the only, if you're the only gig in town that survives and the town moves away, right? I mean, you, you, you want to see. I, I think we ought to have a desire in our hearts to see other people be successful. I have to tell you that my best friends in the world are the ones who can join in the joy of the things that I was successful over the years doing, and I equally joined them while they were successful, that you truly can pat someone on the back and go, way to go, even if they beat you. It's called encouraging people, truly having compassion, wanting to see better for them. And in this picture, I'm down on the border of Iran, and I met with this Iraqi colonel. He was doing supply chain maintenance, supply chain distribution down there with fuel for his army. And he fell underneath my responsibility. And, and, and at that time, down on the border of Iran is much like what's happening with ISIS today. So the Iraqis did not wear their uniform because they didn't wear their uniform off base. Because if they did, their whole family might be killed while they went to work. So they didn't put their uniform on until they got onto the base. So I spent quite a bit of time with him, and I was just in awe of this fact that he, was, he believed so much in wanting democracy for Iraq that he's still willing to wear the uniform, even though he knows that when he's at work, his whole family could be killed. His brother had already been killed. And as you know from seeing on the news, it's not, they're not killed in a, in a, a nice way. I mean, it's just horrible. It's brutal. And um, so at the end of the day, after we served, you know, or talked to each other and everything, spent the day together, we sat down, we had some tea and something to eat, and, and I just felt compelled to thank him for his service, his compassion to serve his country and not worry about himself. And so I, I leaned in and I tapped my, my chest and I said, inshallah, inshallah, thank you, thank you for what you do. Now all day we'd had a translator because he didn't speak very much English at all. And he stood up and he said, no, no, wait. And he went across the room and he got his Iraqi flag off of a staff. He took it off, he folded it, he kissed it, and he gave it to me. We needed no translator. Not one translator. We had tears coming down our cheeks. Why? Because leadership, leading yourself, choosing to lead yourself is about what's on the inside. It's about having passion. It's about having purpose. And at that moment, we both had purpose. I can candidly tell you that my whole life just kind of went in front of me. All, all the mentors and tormentors in my life, all the ups and the downs in my life that got me to that point, I knew that I was at that point for a reason and that I had been prepared to be there. And what I hope and wish for each and every one of you is that you'll have those moments where you're hugging a patient and you don't need even any conversation. You just know, because your hearts are talking to each other, and you know you're in the right place, and you have purpose, and you're leading yourself with passion in your practice. And this is the last one, and I think I only had a minute anyhow, so. But I think this captivates it. If you're doing that, and you have that purpose, and you have that passion, you are going to make a difference. You're going to make a difference in your life. You're not going to just be successful. You're going to be significant. Significant. And I do believe in destiny. I believe everybody has a destiny. But I believe it's always out there. It's not like it's arrived. Your success ended at midnight last night. You got to keep going every day and build on it. I took that picture right after I retired. I took my parents to Alaska on a cruise. We were going out in the afternoon. It was 80 degrees. I spent a little extra money to go with a naturalist. 15 of us on a boat. And the naturalist, you know, the all-knowing person about whales, she says, I'm very sorry, but you're probably only going to see a few tails today. 
And I fish, so I know when it's 80 degrees, where the fish go? To the bottom, right? They're not jumping out of the water looking to be caught. So I knew she knew quite a bit, but I was on a Christian cruise, and there were 3,000 of us praying to see whales. <laughs> so I said, well, I don't know. We'll see. I took 1,000 digital pictures in two hours. We saw double breaches. We saw babies. We saw bubble rings in this one. I didn't even know I had taken because I was taking pictures so fast. And I got back to my room in the, in the ship that night. I saw that picture, and I went, holy cows. I went across and woke my parents up so they could see it. I mean, that's like National Geographic, you know? Make a difference. Celebrate. Celebrate your being a chiropractor. Go viral. Turn up the volume. Have a great conference. Thank you very much. Ooh. <laughs> I'm feeling tall.